it's David, and you're listening to the Tombe's Classical Guitar Podcast. Hope everyone adjusted all right to daylight savings time. That's always a rough one for me. I'm definitely more of a night owl. In fact, I'm usually recording these voiceovers about two or three in the morning uh, when it's finally quiet enough in my apartment complex. I definitely live in a loud uh, college neighborhood, but it's what it is. And I've got to say, it's quite nice having that extra hour of sunshine in the evenings. Anyway, today we've got Nick Galusis on the show. He's the chair of the Classical Guitar Department at Eastwood School of Music in Rochester. I grew up in a suburb in Rochester my whole life, and Nick was really one of my earliest inspirations and reasons to pursue the classical guitar. His records of box and source music done by Noxos really uh, spoke to me at a young age. So I thought I'd play a sample from the Bach record. This is the infamous Fugue from Bach's first violin sonata in G minor. And I love the way Nick transcribed this piece. First of all, he keeps it in G minor, which has such an amazing affect for um, being such a dark and sorrowful sounding key. A lot of guitars do move this up to A minor. It does make it a bit more guitaristic, but it just sounds a little bland and flat to me. So I'm glad he keeps it like that. And he also uses an interesting tuning. He tunes the fifth string A down to a G and then the E down to a D, and it just opens up. It has this amazing resonance and timbre altogether. So here's Box Fugue BWV 1001. Thank you. 
So you were back after quite a trip to China with uh, your flautist duo partner. How was that tour? That was a tour to remember. That was 21 cities in 32 days. It was a marathon, but it was wonderful. The halls are amazing. The people are out of this world. Uh, the traveling was very intense, but my guitar held up and my nails held up and I held up and um, I saw pretty much every corner of China. It's a grand country and a pleasure to be there. Probably didn't have to use a humidifier for this trip. Or, or is it kind of dry in the winter? Over no, there? no, no, no. I mean, they burn coal. So the pollution is is insanely bad, and the the um, the everything is well. It's like the United States. In the north, it's very cold. So up in Shenyang and Kohohate and in um, in Mongolia, it's extremely cold and dry. Whereas down south by Hong Kong, it's it's a lot more humid and quite quite moist. So I use the humidipax. They kind of keep the guitar stable in the case, whether it's super humid or super dry. And they really kept the guitar in great shape for me. That's great. And what was the program for the tour? So this was um, with Bonita Boyd, um, a flute professor here at Eastman, and we've been playing for about 25 years. So we played the Mountain Songs of Beezer. We played Histoire de Tango. We played uh, uh, um, uh, Catherine Hoover, uh, Canyon Echoes. We played La Vida Breve, Il est né le Devin Enfant, uh, Entrac, Libre Tango. It was a kind of a greatest hits sort of program. Yeah. And it was I know a lot of these people were hearing this music for the very first time. So it was a chance for us to be able to really, you know, I mean, they're so hungry for art music. And being able to play for them was just a joy in every way. The flute and guitar is such a beautiful combination. And yeah. you've played quite a bit of chamber music over the years. I've seen you play with uh, uh, Bonita Boyd on flute and uh, Juliana Athayid on violin and many other ensembles. Is there... I mean, I don't want to ask, do you have a favorite uh, person to play with, but is there a favorite instrumentation um, or an instrumentation you find works best for you classical know, I, guitar? You know, I I learned how to breathe working with, with, with Bonnie and also working with Robert Swenson, the tenor. And I remember reading somewhere that Bream said that it changed his playing when he worked, started working with Peter Pears, that he had to learn to breathe and he had to learn how to phrase, and it changed his playing forever. And I can always tell a soloist who's played chamber music, you can just smell it. You can hear the level of commitment to the phrasing, level of commitment to the musical ideas, to the dynamics and everything that you have to commit to when you're playing with somebody else because you have to talk about this stuff. So I've always loved doing it because I like, I like playing with other people, but also it's helped my solo playing a lot. Yeah. In guitarists, a lot of times I think we forget to breathe, both Physically and musically. Yeah, pianists have the same thing. Yeah. You can just play notes and 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 nothing is being said. Whereas when you have to breathe or when you have to follow a bowing, there's a variety that's more than just pluck. Yeah. And and um, I, that's why I think it's always attracted me. And I find going back to singers, 99% of the time, if I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to phrase uh, this musical sentence, if I think of how a singer would perform it. It's usually the best way. Oh, absolutely. I remember when I was young and I played in a Gilead master class and Oscar was singing all over the place and I asked him a question. How do you, and he said, you should play a slur here. And I boldly asked him, well, how do you know that? And he was very patient and he said, by singing it, if you just sing it, you'll hear that you're singing a slur. So you play a slur. And we can do as much singing as possible and it will always help us. You got lucky. It was friendly. <laughs> I got real lucky. I heard uh, I heard some pretty interesting stories. <laughs> I think the stories are all true. Yeah, yeah. But I've heard such amazing things with his teaching. Yep. Yeah. And Segovia was like that too. I mean, he could he could he could be very un un uh, friendly, and he could be as warm as they come. He just never, you know, these guys were kind of a a link to another era. Yeah. But always, you know, there's so much there that we. We still have to remember to do. And you studied with Segovia. Yeah, we, we, I was really lucky. I had some master classes with him early on. And then at one time, I had asked him, right around the time that he was doing master classes at USC in 86, um, I had asked him to do a class at Manhattan School where I was teaching in 87. And he came and gave three master classes, and it was sensational. And I got to have some private lessons with him, and it was really memorable. Oh, that must have been amazing. A vision of beauty and a sound that was totally unique that he'll always, you know, 
it'll it'll always be a signature sound. And he took it to the grave, I think. Yeah. Yep. And have you been to uh, the Metropolitan Museum where they have the instruments? That... Yeah, I was there when he donated those. And there was a TV show called uh, 2020. And Hugh Downs was, you probably don't know these names, but Hugh Downs was a kind of an important, he was kind of like an important uh, TV personality. And he was a very avid classical guitarist. And um, he went with Segovia to Ramirez to have Segovia pick out a guitar for him. And I remember the TV show where, where Hugh Downs says, this is like having Mickey Mantle picking out a bat for you. And so here's Segovia picking out a Ramirez for Hugh Downs. Well, they forged an alliance, a good friendship. And so he came to the Met. And when he, go, when he donated the 1912 Ramirez and the 1937 Hauser, it was a big event and I got to be there. It was wow. really special. It's just amazing looking at those guitars. I remember the first time I went there and seeing that Hauser, especially. Just, oh, that is just a work of art. All those instruments, all generations of, of Hausers. And to think that was the guitar Segovia played on for it's quite a while. He played on that one, maybe yeah. 20 years. Or, His most golden period. And he would probably have continued playing it if it didn't get destroyed by a microphone. So. Oh, you know the, right. you know the story I, about I this? Think I've, remind me about it. So he was, you know, he was playing this guitar. He called it the greatest guitar of the epoch. And in many ways, it was. Because, you know, for all of us, we have, we have, we're lucky. We have great guitars. And if you tap the top of the guitar, you can hear a pitch. Or some people say if you sing into it, you can, you can hear a resonance pitch. G is often the, the pitch. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you hear guitars that are a little higher, a little bit lower. Um, my dominant is down to F. Segovia's was an E. And you had to get a guitar down to that resonance pitch, you've got to pair it down to it's so light that it you feels like it's just gonna break when you play it, but it didn't. It was strong. And so that was that instrument, and it just had this bloom to it. Anyway, the story that I heard was, and I think it's true, is that he was recording. And he was doing one of those one of those MCA records that he did. Um, there's three or four of them that are sensational. The Manen Sonata is one of those, and the Chacon is one of those. And one of, the, one of the large Neumann microphones, it was laying flat on a seat and it fell on the top and it cracked it. Oh. And it went back to Hauser and Hauser either replaced the top or repaired the top. And the story goes that it was never quite the same. Yeah. Probably both the microphone and the guitar. Yeah. Never that, quite the same. Oh, that's, yeah. that's tragic. And I remember hearing stories about Scovia just throwing the Hauser underneath the couch without a case or anything. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, not, not to say that he, he was careless with the instrument, but it, it's just crazy to think something like that happened in a very controlled environment, like a recording studio. But. Right after he died, I went to, uh, to Madrid to see, um, you know, to pay my respects to go to his grave to visit uh, his widow, Amelita. And she took me up to his studio on the fourth floor of their house. They had a four-story brownstone on Cancha Espina, number 53, as I remember we went up to the top floor. It was like walking into Tutankhamun's tomb, right? And so you've got all this stuff. You've got the citations from the emperor of Japan and from the pope and, and from Ox honorary doctorates from Oxford and, of course, Manhattan School of Music. And so all this stuff was up there, stacks of manuscripts and guitars. I saw a couple of flautas. I saw an unbelievable Kono and, um, you know, several Ramirez's. They were just all over the place. Stuff was just thrown. Just lying all, around? All over the place. Not was, even in cases, just... Nope. Oh. <laughs> some, yes, some, no. But it was it was really something. I saw some crazy glue on his desk because he had an A-nail that was split for many years toward the end of his life. Oh, okay. And so he would constantly, like the rest of us, have to repair his nail. And so, I, you know, after all this erudite stuff, I see a tube of crazy glue on his <laughs> on his desk. He's like us all. It was really lucky for me. I really have to say, I, as I think back to that, it was I was young. I was just getting started, and and she was very she was very kind to let me. You know, she said, "You want to see the studio?" And I, I, I didn't know what to say except yes, and I'll never forget it. It's too bad they didn't keep it as kind of a museum. Like they've done with Julia Child's kitchen. I mean, they moved it to a museum, but they have kind of done something like that. Oh, they they have? moved it. Well, yeah, in Linares, where he was born, there is the Andres Segovia Museo, where there's a crypt where he's now buried. Hmm. There's a crypt. Wow. He's down there, and they took everything from his studio and they put it in this this museum. So you can go to Linares, where there's a big bronze statue of Segovia in the center of town. Uh, and you can go to the museum and you can see all that stuff. I don't know if they've recreated 
what it looked like when I saw it that day. Yeah. But it's all there. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. And that's where the Segovia Archive has its residence because all the stuff that Gilardino has published are all those manuscripts that were there. I had no idea. Was, was, did Segovia ever perform on the flights? Or oh yes, yeah. Oh, I, had, I thought it was just Ramirez and Hauser. For no, him. no, they didn't travel well, and they used to crack all over the place. The flights, the flights. Oh, okay. No, that's what happened to mine. I had a beautiful one from 1970. I bought it in '92, and I, when I came up here to Eastman, and within the first, I bought it from Brunei. It was a beautiful, you know, 1970 flight. I love that guitar, and I used it for a couple of my Naxos recordings. And I did everything I could to keep it humidified, and it started to crack. Mm. I got a couple of cracks almost immediately by the fingerboard and a couple of others, and I was freaking out. So I, I realized that it just wasn't going to survive. Barcelona was underwater. I mean, so humid. And he didn't really do anything to keep his humidity level up. So when it was built with that kind of humidity and brought to upstate New York in the winter... Just didn't work. Yeah. So Segovia's fletas had the same fate. And they, they just didn't travel well. And that flight, to, was that the guitar you played for your Soar and Bach records? Yes. Okay. Right, right. And the Love first, those records. And the, thank you. And the first one that I did with Bonnie Boyd, Chronicles of Discovery, I used that for as well. And that's about when I sold it. And you've got a new record coming out pretty soon, correct? Pretty soon, yeah. Um, this is a new one on Lynn Records of the music of Samuel Adler. And Adler has written some really great stuff for guitar. And they're putting out a a three-disc set. Uh, the third of the three discs is the one that I did, and it's got the concerto uh, for guitar and orchestra that I did uh, here with the Eastman um, Philharmonia. And that was a commission that uh, myself, Steve Robinson, and Adam Holtzman uh, shared the commission. And uh, Sam wrote this great guitar concerto. So it's, it's a bit of a beast, but we got it recorded, and I think we have a really, really good recording of that. Um, a piece for two violins and guitar called Ports of Call. And that's based on a trip that Sam took to the Mediterranean. And each movement is based on a port in the Mediterranean. Valencia, Haifa, Marseille, Alexandria, Thessaloniki. And it's actually very accessible, very beautiful, kind of folk-inspired, quirky, you know, chamber music. Um, I did that with Juliana Athade and Rene Jolis here. And then a beautiful duo for, uh, for a viola and guitar that I did with Philip Ying from the Ying Quartet. Mm. And it's a superb piece. It's, it's, a, it's a great piece in three movements called Into the Radiant Boundaries of Light. Um, pretentious title, but it's, it's after a poem of Lucretius. And then finally, there's a piece called Five Choral Scherzi for chorus, guitar, viola. And, um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful setting of these, these various um, poems. How big of a choir? Um, I would say there must be 35 people. Oh, wow. Were you amplified for that? or You know, for recordings, it's really hard to do that and still get a great natural yeah. sound. So the, there was a little amplification in the hall, and then there was a very close miking for the guitar. Mm -hmm. So we were able to kind of get a decent balance. Yeah. Um, for, the, for the concerto also, it's hard to record guitar concertos yeah. and have them sound natural. But I uh, re recorded them in Kilbourne Hall where there's, a, there's, a, there's an... Uh, internal sound reinforcement. So that was providing a little sound for, for the orchestra to hear, but I was close mic'd so that the sound of the guitar went right into, it was a, a Neumann U67, an old tube yeah. Neumann, and a Royer ribbon mic. And I think we got a pretty good sound. Ribbons sound amazing on guitar. Yep. They're I, making a bit of a comeback. It they, seems. Yeah. It seems like it. I understand why they weren't popular for a while because they're just... So damn expensive, and if you if you just blow on it by accident, you destroyed the ribbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On the record that I made before this one, from afar, um, that has Britton Schwantner, um, Faya, Ponce Folias de España, and Theodorakis, um, I used two of the Neumann U67s and two of the Royer ribbons. So there were four mics, and then five Shep mics, Shep's mics, up in the hall to get some of the some of the acoustic. Wow! And it was a ridiculous setup. But the engineer wanted to try it, and it really turned out sounding beautiful. Yeah. I find for my own recording projects, minimum you have to record with two mics for classical guitar to, to get the whole tonal uh, feel and characteristics of the sound and everything. And having all those different microphones for blending purposes, I mean, if you, if you just plug them all in, 
at full blast, it would probably sound awful. But when you can blend a little bit of the the acoustics with the with the microphones above and then close the far mic, it creates a phenomenal sound. I agree. I think that there's a real art to this, and I'm in awe of people who know how to make this work. It's definitely a lot of uh, finicky <laughs> adjustments with microphones. Yes. I remember. Yeah. Here, one of my tech teachers at USC he was telling a story. It was one of the first days at the recording studio he was uh, interning at, and they were setting up microphones. Like, I forgot if they were setting up a drum kit or, or something, and they told him, they're in the control room, and they told him, oh, go over there and move it just about a centimeter to the right. Yeah. And he'd hustle in there and do that, come back, and then they say, well, move it back a, a half centimeter. And, <laughs> and he was thinking they were just totally messing with him uh, as he was a newbie. But it it can be that finicky sometimes. Yeah. Small things can add up to a big change in sound when it comes to recording arts. Especially with the guitar. You know, yeah. the guitar is like such a primitive thing. It's one step up from a drum, really. Yeah. And where you put the microphone in relationship to the instrument distance-wise and where in relationship to the bridge or the sound hole um, is night and day. And I still don't know how, how that's done. But I think that everybody's instrument is unique and everybody's sound is unique. And I think a good engineer has the ability to find those placements. I remember the, the Naxos recordings I did with Norbert Kraft. Uh, Norbert was using two Neumann U87s mm -hmm. uh, about 10 feet away, and then two Neumann KM84s way up in the rafters of this church that he always uses up there in Aurora, north of Toronto, yeah. for mics. And it was uh, the most beautiful sound. And I just think he just managed to do it with two very stock U87s and two KM84s. And I think that it's just, you know, he's got amazing ears, and he... He knows what to listen for, and, he, and he's got a great church. There's no right or wrong way to record. There's just so many different factors. But I, I think some of the best sounding records for classical guitar are coming through Naxos. And of course, it's Norbert Kraft doing that. And yeah. with his experience yeah. as an amazing guitarist, I, I'm sad. He, does he play anymore? Or is... I don't think so. I mean, I remember when he did play, it was sensational. Yeah. It was like it was Titanic playing. His and... Via Lobos recordings are just yeah. amazing. No, he was like the Segovia of Canada. He was playing with every orchestra, with on the most high-profile chamber series, and he he deserved it. I mean, it's so he was sensational playing, and um, you know you can always tell someone you can always tell how someone lives their life when you can hear when you hear them play. You know, he was a man of great. He is a man of great integrity and beauty, and uh, and you can hear it in his playing, and his playing reflects who he is. And I find yeah. that to be true of pretty much everybody that I know. The people whose playing I like the most are the people I tend to really like the most. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you thinking about recording more Bach? Maybe the partitas? You know, I, I just released the, the, the edition of the, the sonatas. It took me all this time to get it worked out. And I got that out. And now I feel like I can put that behind me. I've been thinking about, you know, maybe playing more Bach. Um, and the partitas is an obvious choice because I love them and I, I do play them. Um, but I think I need to play them a lot before I commit to that. And I thought about actually a couple of other keyboard works that, that I really like a lot. One of them is the Capriccio on the Departure of a Beloved Brother. I don't know if you know this piece. So, you know, Bach was an orphan. And as a very, very, very young man, he went to live with his, his uh, cousin, who ended up going into the army. And um, Bach wrote this piece that's highly programmatic very young Bach. It's even before like the first lute suite. So I think it's from around 17, I don't know, 1714. It's very young. Um, and he wrote this piece and each of the movements has programmatic titles. So the first one is called um, His Friends Try to Persuade Him to Abandon His Journey. And it's full of these pleading appoggiatura and it's very expressive and it's very beautiful. And there's, um, the second movement is, uh, they suggest various accidents which may befall him in foreign lands. It's full of these tritones, it's pretty dramatic, wow. diminished chords and stormy and chromatic fantasy and fugue sort of stuff. Yeah. The, there's a beautiful uh, postillion's horn call 
the postillion horn goes yum ba dum so the fugue subject is yum ba da bum 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 be dum bum ba da bum 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 be da ba 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 da ba ba bum be da bum ba da bum be da bum be da bum be da dum bum 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 be da and this is big fugue it's fantastic so never heard of that piece I'll have to oh it's check it out it's so it it's the amazing. coolest of the cool there's a Leonhardt recording on on harpsichord in which he actually speaks the subtitles oh wow and so I've been looking at that a lot. And because my son is in the army and I, I worry about him every minute of every day, I can kind of relate to Bach, you know, watching his beloved relative going off to war. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of wolves in the woods and I worry about Harry. He's a captain in the army and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's right out there at the tip of the spear. Wow. So it's kind of got a lot of meaning for me. I thought about that piece a lot. Yeah. That, I don't know of any guitarists who plays that. Are, are you the... I don't know. Maybe. You might be the only one who's who plays that. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised that someone's looked yeah. at it. And also I've been looking at a couple of the French suites. Okay. Yeah, those are beautiful pieces. And they're not so dense, so it, it could work. Yeah. Is uh, Back to the programmatic piece, is that a fairly popular piece uh, on keyboard, or is it just kind of this unknown work that... So you know the Neuerbach Ausgabe that has the lute works. Um, this thing over here. You know about these books, right? The Neubach Ausgabe. It mm -hmm. has the complete works of Bach. And so I got this because I wanted to have the lute works. Here's probably if you can like But if you go leafing through this thing and you look at some of the earlier works in here, one of them is the Capriccio. And I just kind of stumbled upon it. Here's the fugue on the Postilion's horn call. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so it just happens, it just to, happened be to be in, in the same volume that the you know, Neubach Ausgabe Samlichtelwerke has the lute works, it just happens to be in there earlier in that particular volume. So I came across it and I thought, what is this? And I started looking at it and uh, phew, worth looking at. It's a lot like playing the first lute suite, okay. the 996 lute suite. Yeah. It's the same kind of style and the same sort of texture. That's a keyboard piece as well. And it works on the guitar and so does this. What a great discovery. For... Could be cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that That's fantastic. I, I don't know if you've seen the documentary by Michael Lawrence, uh, Bach and Friends. Oh, yes. It's, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, fantastic, super long, three-hour documentary yeah. about Bach, but ne never never gets dry or boring. And they interview all these different musicians, ranging from Manuel Boeco to uh, Hilary Hahn to mm -hmm. PDQ Bach. I mean, just, a and Bela Fleck and Chris Tealy, just anyone yeah. you can think of. Yeah. And one of my favorite parts of it, I, I forgot if it, I think it was Philip Glass talking about it. And he was saying, Bach wrote so many works that it was impossible for him to really have time to edit out all of them. And a lot of what you're hearing is just coming straight from your head, which is just amazing. And there's so many, I, I'm sure there are just so many works out there that people are totally unaware of that are just gems for the repertoire. There's just such a huge volume. And it's not like Beethoven where, don't get me wrong, I love Beethoven, amazing composer. There are some Beethoven pieces that are just bad. <laughs> but Bach, I've never heard anything from Bach that, that didn't have the same impact as uh, any of the other great pieces that he wrote. I, I think one of the reasons why Bach is truly the old dog is because he was teaching the entire time. I think Bach was never living, living in his own world. He was living in the world of other people. He was writing music from a, a pragmatic point of view. He was, had tons of students. He was humble. He was writing music for the glory of God. And he just had a gift that nobody else really had because he crystallized everything that came before him. I think that um, the teaching aspect of his composition made a big difference. And I think that's partly why there's so much music I also know that there's a lot of music that we never will hear. Like the sonatas and partitas were found in a butcher shop in a stack of paper ready to wrap meat. And that's what- A butcher shop. A butcher shop. The, the original manuscript. The manuscript. And you know, if you look at the manuscript, it says, say solo uh, por, viol, por violino uh, sansa basso. So that means no bass, no accompaniment. Uh, Schumann wrote accompaniments in the 19th century, but he want you know no accompaniment in the on the the idea was this music was going to be lost forever. And at the bottom of the first of the title page it says Libro Primo, first book. So what does that mean? Is there another book? We don't have it. 
Is the cello suites the second book? Probably not. So what the hell else is there out there? And we know the, the accounts of the bookbinders from Curtin alone staggeringly um, are, are greater than what we have from that period. And Curtin was his most interesting period because he was not writing church music, he was writing secular music. Brandenburg concertos, orchestral suites, well-tempered clavier, sonatas and partitas for unaccompanied violin, violin and harpsichord sonatas. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. And that's just the stuff we know. So there's so much Bach out there that we'll never even hear. And the documentary, it's a three-hour long documentary and showed a great range of the repertoire, but didn't touch at all on the choral works of Bach. And he's written an immense volume of choral works as oh, well. Yeah. Well, he was writing church music. That's you yeah. know, the music is for the is for the chorus, and stuff is unbelievable. Like, I mean, how many cantatas this is, did this man write? One after the next for every Sunday, for many many Cantata liturgical week, years. Yeah, yeah. So, and they're unbelievable. And you know, if you go to Baldwin Wallace University uh, College Conservatory in Ohio, there's a vault, and they have down in that vault the largest collection of Bach cantata original manuscripts. Oh, wow. And when I played there many years ago, they actually took me down there to see them. And the thing that's interesting about the cantatas is that these were scores written for amateurs. So the Boeings are meticulously written out by Bach because he didn't want to oh, just... Oh, wow. Yeah, so if you want to learn about Bach phrasing and subphrasing and Boeings, look at the cantatas. I had no idea about that because I always thought it was kind of a, a mystery, at least with the sonatas and partitas. What did Bach want exactly with certain Boeings or fingerings, but... Right. And he was a violinist. I mean, he was hired in Weimar as a violinist. His grandfather was a violinist. His father was a violinist. There, he comes from a tradition of violin playing. And he knew the works of Bieber. And he knew the works of von Westhoff. He knew all these guys. And so he wrote this music based on what they had already set up. But the cantatas, that's a whole other matter. And that's wow. worth looking at. What I find so great about Bach is it translates beautifully to many different instruments. Of course, it sounds great on the guitar and original instruments, lute, harpsichord, um, violin, cello. But some of the, in the documentary, I mean, when Chris Tilly on mandolin plays the Bach and Bela Fleck on banjo, when I first heard them introduce Bela Fleck, I'm thinking, oh, why would you play Bach on banjo? That's just going to sound awful. And I'm sure you can play it awfully on banjo, but the way he approaches the music, it's just beautiful. It's gorgeous. I've heard it described as durable. His durable, music. yes. Uh, uh. That it will, it can, it it is it's strong enough to accommodate all of these crazy ideas, and it still comes across as some of the most perfect music ever created. It's the perfect marriage of the sensual and the intellectual, and it's so durable that you can play it on the marimba and have it sound beautiful. Yeah, I I think I've heard the the famous toccata and fugue on marimba. And I'm sure it's a it's a blast. Yeah, and on that Bach. Uh, uh, documentary that you were describing, Manuel plays the G minor fugue mm. so incredibly beautifully. I mean, when I hear that and I wa I'm watching him play it, I just think this man is probably taking the art form uh, to a to a very very special level that that represents you know the highest levels of virtuosity and still very humble in in the same way. I love that performance on that that documentary yeah, that he gives. It's beautiful. He plays so beautifully. Now, what was, uh, what was your approach to making your transcriptions? I'd be interested to hear, because I'm assuming when you studied with Manuel, you probably played a lot of Bach to him, and Manuel is known as well for his transcriptions of the yeah. sonatas. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I know that when I was studying with him, we worked on the C major sonata. That was the first one I looked at. And he was already pretty familiar with it. Um, at that time, you know, these pieces weren't really played by guitarists. It was kind of a new thing. Uh, that we had, you know, we'd started looking at these pieces because up until there it was cello suites and lute suites. But um, I remember working on the C major sonata with him, and he loved that piece. Um, after I finished, um, we studied. I studied with him for about six years, and after after those, after those days of working on the C major, I started looking at the the second sonata, which I then found to be a piece that Wilhelm Friedman Bach, Bach's oldest son, arranged for the harpsichord. And I thought, okay, well, what's, what's here? I mean, because Wilhelm Friedman was kind of a wild man. And so that transcription, he puts it into D minor, but he adds all kinds of stuff. 
So I tried to incorporate as much of that as I could in the first and third movements of, of my arrangement of the second sonata. The first sonata always impressed me as being the most high Baroque of the three. So it goes from G minor, which is dark, taut, high Baroque, to the second sonata, which is brighter, to the C major sonata, which even though it's so big, it's quite bright. And it's got all these parallel sixths. So the, the cycle of all three sonatas goes from dark to, to light. Never thought of it that way. That's, and that's, that's really neat. And that's why I took the, the G and the, the, the fifth string down to G and the sixth string down to D for the first sonata to give it a darker it sound. It has such a sad, sorrowful sound and openness with that tuning. Yes. I thought it made it sound more like the affect of G minor. I thought it just gave it a lot more weight. And then the second sonata lightens up, and then the, by the time you get to the third sonata, there's a, just a brightness to it that always made the whole s set of three work together yeah. as a set. And I appreciate you keeping it G minor so much. I mean, you're talking about it being the darkest sounding of the three, and it, it makes even more sense in the cycle. Think of it that way. There's so many guitars who play it in A minor, and I, G minor is such a special sounding key on the guitar. I mean, partly because we don't play too often in G minor, but especially with the tuning you're using, it just has this dark resonance that's hard to describe in words for me. And when you put it in A minor, it just, I don't want to say it sounds bright or anything. And the A minor sonata is an amazing sonata as well. And it's in that key, but it just doesn't work for the, for the style of writing for the first sonata. And yeah. I think it's cheating. <laughs> it certainly, it certainly changes the piece. Yeah. And, and you know, Bach, Always, I mean, whenever we come up with something, Bach's already done it. Like, for example, the fifth cello suite, which we now call the 995 lute suite. Uh, Bach arranged it for the lute later. But originally, it's a cello suite. Well, that's got a score natura, too. The, the tuning of that in the original has got the top string tuned down from A to G. So it loosens up the cello. It gives it more of a gamba-like sound, a warmer, fatter sound, and it's in C minor. So Bach's already told us that you should think about doing these kinds of things to get the affect of these keys. So C minor is a pretty dark key, three, three flats. And G minor, too. And so when you use a scordatura like that, it changes the sound of the instrument, just like Bach did. And it gives us a sense of maybe this gets us closer to the, the sound he was looking for. Thank you, Dick, for being on the show. Please join me in two weeks for a conversation with the king of AMI scales, Matt Palmer. Leave things today with a recording of the third movement from Samuel Adler's Concerto for Guitar and Orchestra that Nick spoke of earlier in this episode. The title of this movement is Fast and with Good Spirit. I'm David Steinhardt, and we'll see you next time for the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast.
Thank you. 